What's up guys, it's Chad with Living the Van Life up here in Washington. I just returned from my epic adventure all the way up to the Arctic Ocean and back. 4,908 miles, 96 hours of driving. As I was planning the trip to go up there, I was sitting down here in 45 degree weather and I'm researching temperatures up there that are down into negative 30 all the way down into negative 40 so we're talking like anywhere from 80 to 90 degrees difference in temperature and when it comes to planning a trip like that there's so many different extremes that you have to prepare for and as i set out on my journey over the last few weeks i learned so much about what it takes to actually complete an adventure like that while living in a van so here in this video, I want to give you guys the inside of everything that I learned in order to make this a successful trip all the way to the Arctic Ocean and back. This right here is the Arctic Circle. It's been a hell of a push, it's been a lot of driving, but it's been a hell of an adventure. After more than 40 hours of driving, I'm standing in the most unbelievable winter landscape. Mile after mile just clicking by, 17 to 18 more hours to go to reach the Arctic Ocean. It feels like it's just never ending. So far, I've driven all the way to the very top of British Columbia, all the way through the Yukon, and now entering Northwest Territory. We have officially entered the insanity zone, negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's get this show on the road. We got a trip to the Arctic Ocean to make. So when it came to planning this trek all the way up to the Arctic Ocean at the top of Canada, I spent a lot of time researching maps, looking at routes, and really starting to get an idea of the amount of distance that I was gonna have to cover in order to make this trip. Now home base starts out right here in the Pacific Northwest all the way at the upper left-hand corner of the United States. So when it comes to driving from here, just to get to the top of British Columbia, Canada, we're talking 1,228 miles, which is very similar to driving from here all the way to Los Angeles. So that started putting things into perspective. Now once I get to the top of British Columbia, that's only halfway to getting to my destination at the Arctic Ocean. The thing is, the further north that I get, services and civilization starts getting fewer and further in between. Alaska and northern Canada has become a popular destination for travelers during the summertime. So there's been a lot of services that have been put in uh, throughout the years and it's quite convenient for people to travel up there. The only thing is, this time around, I'm doing it in the dead of winter. That means that a significant amount of these services are actually not even open. So where it looks like there might be fuel stations, you got to beware because this time of year, services are extremely limited and the hours that these services are open are extremely limited part of today's technology and being able to use our cell phones as part of navigation it's convenient to be able to look up on our phones as we drive to find out where gas stations are available the thing to beware on a trek like this is even though the phone is saying that there is gas stations 10 miles ahead many times you show up to these gas locations and because it's the dead of winter they're all closed up and there's 10 feet of snow surrounding the gas pumps and you might still have another 100 miles to go the point of all of this is it is extremely important to plan out your routes know what services are available and when they're available in the winter time when it comes to planning out these routes and planning out your fuel stops it's 
extremely important to understand what kind of miles per gallon that you get or kilometers per liter that you get on your particular vehicle. It's also extremely important to understand what kind of miles or what kind of kilometers you can get out of a full tank of fuel. And that becomes your fuel range of your vehicle. Now, when I got up into Northern BC and up into Yukon and stretching on into Northwest Territories, there were some highways that I hit there was 250 miles of distance, and I mean remote distance in the wilderness between fuel stops. And let's put it this way, the, the old Vanagon has a fuel range of about 200 to 210 miles. The Vanagon wouldn't have made those distances between services. Here on the Sprinter van, I get about 285 to 295 miles per tank, and I was able to travel safely and comfortably between these fuel stops way up north. Now, one thing that I was always very diligent about is using my Apple device to set up a navigation to my next fuel stop. It would tell me what kind of distance I had until I reached my destination, which was my fuel stop. Let's say I had 150 miles to my destination and the van readout would say I've got 190 miles till empty. That gave me the confidence that I was on track to make my fuel stop safely and comfortably. I have always talked diligently about my heat source here in the Sprinter van and the fact that I use a diesel heater as my main source of heat. It keeps me warm all through the winter time and it works great. The nice thing about having a diesel heater on board a diesel powered vehicle is the fact that I can draw my fuel for the heat directly out of the fuel tank. What's important about this is the fact that that does affect your fuel mileage and your fuel range. So anytime you are running an operation like this, it's important to take into consideration what kind of fuel your heat source is drawing if it's drawing off of the main tank. Now also one thing that I tried to take in consideration as I'm traveling these long distances between fuel stops is the fact of what time do these fuel stations close. During wintertime seasons a lot of these fuel stations are closing up at 6 in the evening or even 7 in the evening and that's fine you might show up just after business hours are done, you sleep in the parking lot and you grab fuel the next morning. But the fact that my heat is actually powered by diesel I had to take in consideration that I needed enough fuel to run the heat throughout the night. I always made it a main rule of mine to arrive to my fuel destination before 5 p.m. to make sure that I was able to get in within normal business hours. Now upon arriving to these fuel stops during business hours, I would always make sure and top off my fuel that night. That way I knew that if I was leaving early in the morning, I'd have fuel. But most importantly, the fact is that my diesel heater would be running on a full tank of fuel all through the night, keeping me nice, warm, and safe. Now, one thing that's important to take into consideration when we're talking about large distances between fuel services is carrying extra fuel. Nowadays, we see on all these overland vehicles just strapped up with lots of fuel tanks and extra fuel and all that stuff, which is a great idea. It's always best to come prepared. In the situation here in the Sprinter van, I did travel with an extra five gallons of diesel fuel that I kept in the back of the van. And to be honest with you, that actually gave me a great sense of security, knowing that if something did happen, maybe I got stuck in a snowdrift and I had to spend extra time and fuel, or perhaps there was that time when I showed up after the fuel station was closed for the night and I needed to use that five gallons of diesel uh, to run the heat through the night until I could top off with fuel in the morning. The extra fuel was a great added sense of security and making this trek all the way to the Arctic. One thing that's great with overlanding and four-wheel drive travel becoming such a big thing these days is that lots of companies are making extra capacity fuel tanks for all sorts of different vehicles. Matter of fact, there are companies that make extra oversized fuel tanks for the Sprinter vans. And to be honest with you, if I were to consider this trip again, that is something I would certainly consider adding to the van is the extra oversized fuel capacity of an auxiliary tank. Now let's spend a little bit of time talking about navigation. Now whether I am doing an overland route through the desert, through the mountains, or all the way up to the Arctic Ocean, I've been a firm believer in knowing exactly 
where I'm at on the globe at all times. And I do that a couple different ways. My main form of navigation is using my iPad that's mounted to the dash of my Sprinter van, and I run Gaia Maps on that. Before I go out and do a route, I spend an extensive amount of time planning out my routes, laying it out on the map. In this instance, when I went to the Arctic Circle, I did research to find out where the fuel stops are, and I mapped that out on my route as well, so that I always had access to that information. The thing is, you're spending hours and hours and hours and sometimes days without cell phone service. So it's not like, hey, I need to find a fuel stop. You pull up your phone and you find the next fuel stop. That's not gonna work out here. So planning, researching, and understanding everything about your route is very important. Now I'll also double that up and actually use my phone with Apple Maps uh, to guide my way as well. Now the nice thing about that is, is that uh, I'll set it for the next destination. It'll give me the distance till arrival, it'll tell me the estimated time of arrival, and it also tells me how many more hours of driving. Now when you're spending days and days out in the middle of nowhere driving, it is extremely nice to know all of this information and helping get you there safely. On day one of setting out on the 500 mile long Dempster Highway that runs from Dawson City all the way up to Inuvik in Northwest Territories, I started seeing temperatures down to negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit all the way down to even negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Now if we think of a vehicle blasting down a road at 60, 65 miles an hour and all of that extreme cold air blasting right through the grill, into the radiator, into the oil coolers, what it does is it actually prohibits the engine from reaching its optimal operating temperature. The temperatures are so cold and when you're driving 50 to 60 miles an hour, it becomes too overpowering for the engine to actually keep up and build enough heat to operate properly. Now when an engine can't reach its optimal operating temperature, things start to go wrong. It starts with not even being able to blow warm air through your heater into the cab. Then you start noticing things like the transmission isn't at the proper operating temperature and the engine oil isn't even at the operating temperature and then things start to fail. About three quarters of the way through my day one of the Dempster, this thing threw a warning at me saying that the diesel exhaust fluid system was actually beginning to fail and it told me that I had only 10 starts left before it would go into emergency operation mode and the whole thing shuts down and leaves me stranded in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, that's the uh, limitation to these things. They've put so much emissions, they start failing up here and talking with these locals, they, they kind of laugh at me and be like, yep, those systems, not good in the far north. Equipment just has a hard time working in these kinds of conditions. People start actually covering their grills with material in order to block that cold air from blasting into the engine. Now, to adapt and overcome the possible catastrophe that I was then facing, I was able to finagle up some cardboard boxes and actually improvise my own custom winter front here on the front of the Sprinter van. The whole idea is to be able to block off these air passages and hold back that cold frigid air from blasting into your engine. Hopefully adding the cardboard to the front of this resolves that issue. Um, we're gonna find out once we start driving here. Trying to deal with the elements, trying to adapt and overcome, get ourselves through this. Although I've had to make some modifications to it for it to actually withstand this cold, it's much, much happier now. And now this Sprinter van is getting us all the way up to the Arctic. Northwest Territories, let's go. So the moral of this whole idea is the fact that when I do this trek again to the Arctic, I'm coming prepared with a winter front, all ready to go, fit and custom made, so that I don't have to worry about dealing with this in temperatures of negative 35 degrees on the fly. So on another note, for those of us that are running the newer age diesel engines that require diesel exhaust fluid, otherwise known as DEF, make sure and carry extra containers of DEF fluid on board with you. There's times where you're out on these vast open roads, you're not actually able to obtain DEF 
from certain gas stations. I opted to carry at least two containers worth of DEF fluid, and that goes for really anywhere, whether you're out in the desert, whether you're down in Baja, or up in the extreme wilderness of northern Canada. Next up, we're gonna talk about batteries. I am a huge firm believer in the fact that batteries are the lifeline of anything when it comes to van life. Now, especially when you're traveling up into extreme temperatures like this, and here we are at negative 40 degrees, and this whole entire operation is depending on the Battleborn lithium batteries. It has become the lifeline of this whole entire project. All the camera gear is charged there, all my lighting, most importantly, the heat. You wanna have the most reliable power system possible. Now, the Battleborn lithium batteries perform excellent in cold weather. The only thing is you do have to keep them warm because when it comes to recharging the batteries, that's where you come into problems if the batteries get too cold. The great thing is Battleborn actually has a heated battery that they sell specifically for these purposes. They will actually kick in heat, keep the batteries up at the proper temperature so that when it comes to recharging them at the end of the day, you're good to go. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for your battery system to be complete and reliable. Not only is it keeping your lights on, not only is it keeping your food cold, but it's also providing your heat source. You got the diesel heater cranking away in here so things are nice and cozy. Hey Siri, what's the temperature outside? It's minus 24 degrees outside. Right now it's showing as 67 degrees here inside the van. All the way down to actually powering your navigation devices and your satellite communication devices that are gonna let somebody know if you're in extreme danger or need help. It's so important to make sure your battery system is up to snuff. It's not the thing that you wanna skimp on. For those of us that are running diesel heaters inside our vans, one thing that is important is during your installation, make sure that your air intake is actually accessible. One thing that I experienced on my trek up to the Arctic is that after driving thousands of miles on snow and ice, the intake of the heater actually plugged up with powdery snow and caused runnability issues. I came out one evening and discovered that my heater was actually off. Luckily, I was able to crawl under my van, get access to the intake, shook it off, resolve the issue. So, one thing I would say is make sure that the intake is accessible, also the exhaust is accessible. I started smelling a uh, tinge of diesel exhaust inside the van and figured it had to bend with the heater. The end of the tailpipe down here ended up filling up with ice and actually plugged up the exhaust. Tapped the end of that pipe and luckily it became unplugged and it's all fine. Now it's actually building up some heat, starting to thaw that pipe out, so I think we'll be okay now. Unfortunately, the exhaust of these diesel heaters end up in spots a lot of times where they're susceptible to spray from the slush, the snow, the ice, the rain, etc. So what I like to do in these cold, cold situations is crank the heater up so it's generating enough heat to keep itself thawed out. And that was a mistake I made before I traveled today is I still had it set on low and it just couldn't keep up to, to keep its system uh, thawed out. One other note on the diesel heater is making sure that while you're traveling, down the roads for hours and hours, go ahead and turn your heater all the way on high. It's gonna keep the exhaust hot and actually keep it from plugging up with snow and ice as you're driving down the road. One thing that I've realized over the years of van life, even going all the way back to living in the van again, is that window coverings can actually provide a huge amount of insulation. Now, traveling up north into Canada, when temperatures dropped, way, way below zero, I realized that insulation was going to be absolutely key in making van life survivable and comfortable. Uh, here in the Sprinter van, I actually have invested in an entire window covering set. Now these are actually made by Tourig. Uh, this one is actually made to fit the slider windows. What's nice about this is here inside the window coverings, it's made with closed cell foam, which actually works very, very well for insulation. And it also makes a nice compact, storable window covering. 
Now, not only do these provide insulation, but it also provides a blackout option if you want privacy. Uh, for summertime, when you're actually keeping out the heat, on the other side, it's got heat reflectiveness. This is a nice multi-use window covering here and it rolls up stores nicely here inside the van i also have the window coverings up here on the side i've got the front partition closed over here on the slider door i've also got the uh the window covering all of that is attributing to keeping this nice and comfortable now i have this set for every single window that's here inside my sprinter van and it really really helped keep me warm safe and comfortable inside the van now going beyond that most of us in van life have some sort of roof vent. I've got one in the back, I've got one in the forward area, and it's pretty common to have like the max air fans or some of the other fan options, but most of the time they are a 14 by 14 space. Those vents are just a thin layer of plastic that actually separate the inside from the outside. And if we think about that, all our heat rises to the top. For this trip, what I did do is I bought some insulated inserts that fit in these front and back uh, this is a 14 by 14 inch foam pad it's got the reflectix on the back and then also a nice uh, cozy fuzzy barrier on the other side this tucks up inside the roof vent and also helps insulate the inside of the van i will say that the fit is not anything to write home about in fact i've had to do a little bit of trimming i have to stuff them up there and they just kind of sit in there they work for overnight. They're serving their purpose right now. All of this goes together and adds up to keeping your living space warm when you're way out in the Arctic temperatures. From there, I'm gonna take you guys to the back and I'm gonna show you how I used a rear partition to help insulate my living space as well as some extra insulation for underneath the van. So here we are standing at the back of the Sprinter van with the rear doors open. Now I have designed the rear space of this van to be as useful as possible so I'm always accessing this. Part of the problem is when I do have the rear doors open is that my living space becomes extremely exposed to the elements outside. That's why I invested in this rear partition. It's got magnets that are installed around the perimeter which makes it quick and easy to install. Now this thing actually provides a couple different options of insulation, blackout, etc. And I'm going to show you guys now how easily this just installs to cover up this area. It's providing several different benefits to van life. Number one, is this is providing a nice barrier of insulation. It keeps the heat inside, it keeps the cold air out. Driving down the road at negative 35 degrees at 60 miles an hour, these windows actually build up ice on the inside of it. So what that tells me is that this partition is holding the heat in and keeping the cold out. The other nice benefit is, is that this is actually built to be waterproof. So anytime I've got the rear doors open to access what's underneath here, then I don't have any sort of precipitation, whether it's rain or snow, falling down onto the bed. This partition keeps the elements out. One thing that I found to be very useful was to have as much information about your journey as you travel. Now, one thing that was important for me was understanding what's going on temperature-wise in and around the van. With this cool little temperature monitor, I can actually hook up to three different sensors and monitor the temperatures wirelessly. So this guy will tell me what the temperature is inside the living space. I also installed a sensor here underneath the garage space because I have important items like my battery system. I have all the electronics that go along with that battery system. I also have camera equipment and various other items that I don't want getting too cold while I travel. Also, I installed a sensor on the outside of the van so that I can continually monitor what's going on for temperature outside. All of this data comes together to be important and pertinent information as you travel into these extreme conditions. During this trek, I learned that I perhaps made a mistake during my build process and not actually having some sort of heat source plumbed into the back area here. Being able to monitor these temperatures, I realized just a day or two in that temperatures here inside the garage were starting to dip below freezing. So I had to make some quick moves, adapt and overcome. I actually stopped and got a, an extra couple of sleeping bags that you can see here I've just tucked underneath my bed. 
and this drapes over. That actually really provided a lot of insulation and actually kept the cold air from blasting through the rear doors into the garage area. Once I had the sleeping bag set here over this base, I actually installed a general purpose drop light with a 100 watt incandescent light bulb. I plugged that into the inverter, which is running off the battery bank and just hung it from the bottom of the bed platform. That actually provided a heat source that kept this area at a nice comfortable 50 to 60 degree Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, it's negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit outside. One of the other things that I found to be a bonus with the extra sleeping bags that I got on board was a, it's an extra added sense of security. If everything goes wrong, I end up broken down in a snow drift and run out of diesel. I have no heat. At least I've got the extra sleeping bags on board. The moral of the story is don't come into extreme conditions like this unless you are fully over prepared. As I prepared for my trip up north, I spent a lot of time researching the internet, looking for information of what kind of clothing and what kind of gear do I need to have on board in order to keep myself safe, warm, and comfortable. Now I found that there wasn't really a large amount of information about this. So one thing that I want to cover in this video is the kind of clothing and gear that you need to have on your person in order to stay safe out in these cold temperatures that dip way into the negatives. We have officially entered the insanity zone, negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not saying that this is the ultimate gear. This is just what worked for me and hopefully it gives you some insight of perhaps what might work for you in your journey. Now staying warm and safe starts with a good base layer. Now the rule of thumb on anything that you wear when you're going out into extreme cold temperatures is no cotton. I can't say it enough, no cotton. The term they coined, cotton kills. So what you wanna stay with is anything wool and anything synthetic like polyester. So starting out with a good base layer. So what I've got here is a set of Wool X heavy duty merino wool base layers. These are like your long johns. This is the top, these are the bottoms. It's nice to have these nice and form fitting to your body because you're gonna layer up with things over the top. Then once you got your base layers on, it's good to have a nice liner sock. Again, that's polyester. This is gonna be the first sock that goes on. And then over the top, you're gonna layer up with the heaviest duty wool sock that you can get. I got a nice set of Wool X heavy duty wool socks here. Go around the top of that. Now over the top of your base layer, you wanna go with a nice, thick, comfortable fleece layer. These are my fleece bottoms. These ones are actually made by Patagonia. It's like a nice sweatpants, but these are nice and thick. They're polyester and the polar fleece just keeps you so, so warm. This is hugely important. For the fleece layer on your top, I've got here uh, just a zip up fleece. Again, it's a polyester polar fleece. Uh, this one's made by REI, but it goes nicely over the Wool X base layer. Once you've got your Merino wool base layer and your polar fleece, next up you wanna have a nice, good quality snow pant. Now, I feel like it's important to invest into this because this is going to be your ultimate protection. These are Arc'teryx, they're Gore-Tex, so up here in the more moist winters, they're gonna keep you dry. When you get up into the Arctic and temperatures get down into the far negatives, you actually don't have to worry about waterproofness as much because, let's face it, nothing's melting and getting wet at those kind of temperatures. So these are a nice, comfortable pair of pants. They've got suspenders to help keep the pant up, which is nice anytime you're working around a campfire or in my case, out filming. So, good pair of snow pants, an absolute must. Now we're gonna talk about footwear. Footwear in extreme cold temperatures is absolutely important. Of course, again, you wanna have something that's gonna keep you dry, but most importantly, something that's gonna keep you warm. A lot of boots can become really tight and form fitting around your foot. That's not necessarily a good thing because the whole idea of keeping your foot warm is maintaining circulation to your extremities. The nice thing about these Sorel Caribou boots is that they do fit loosely on your foot. They actually have wool liners that are extremely warm. I've really liked these boots in all my winter situations. The thing that I did find when I was up at negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit that these boots were actually still marginal and that's with both of my socks on and these nice warm liners that are inside it. So don't go anything less than something like this. Moving beyond footwear, the other important thing is, is having a nice, warm, comfortable pair of gloves. 
in my situation I came with a couple pairs of gloves because I'm out filming in extreme conditions I want to be able to keep my hands warm but I also need to maintain some sort of dexterity so that I can operate the buttons on my camera these here are made by a brand called Sirius these are their extreme line the nice thing is is that they still maintain some sort of dexterity but they are actually windproof they're waterproof and uh, I found these to be warm for maybe five to ten minutes when I stepped out of the van to film some short clips so these are handy just for jumping out and uh, working around the van whatever else you're doing for dexterity I highly recommend these but they're not going to keep you warm for too long and that's where it's important to then have a nice pair of mittens now the difference between mittens and a good set of winter gloves is that mittens are just an extra added level of warmth the whole concept with mittens is the fact that when you put them on all your fingers are hanging out together and they're actually keeping each other warm versus a glove where all your fingers are in separate chambers you don't have the extra added benefit of everything keeping each other warm that's why mittens are actually used by all of the locals up in the Arctic. Anytime I was out of the van for long periods of time, I was super comfortable with these mittens. A couple of the other key components when it comes to staying warm in these extreme temperatures is a balaclava. Balaclava is basically a ski mask. And what this does is it goes over, it covers your head, it covers your face, and it comes all the way down uh, below your neck. It's important to have one that is nice and insulated this one just also happens to be windproof. Waking up here this morning, it's negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which is important because the wind absolutely howls up in the Arctic. Bit of a wind blowing here this morning, so the wind chill factor is definitely down there. Any bit of skin that you have exposed, like your ears, your chin, your nose, any of that stuff can quickly become uh, frostbitten. So the balaclava actually was really, really uh, key in keeping me warm and safe now over the top of the balaclava Then of course I put a nice heavy-duty thick wool hat this particular hat has a uh, Polar fleece liner which adds another extra line of insulation over your ears These two come together and make for very comfortable headwear last but not least is going to be a good winter parka or a good winter coat Your core is the most important part to keep warm. That's going to keep the rest of your body warm I've been a huge firm believer for many years that down is perhaps one of the best ways to stay warm. The nice thing about down is that it's light and it's maneuverable and they're just good functional coats. The one that I've had for years I felt like was a little bit too light to deal with the Arctic conditions. So as I traveled north, I stopped in Yukon and actually found this North Face jacket that is a waterproof outer. It's also windproof, but it's a nice heavy down on the inside. It's got the uh, fur on the hood. This hood is insulated and it actually will draw down over your face. Having a good winter parka is absolutely key in these kinds of conditions. I just want to emphasize that it is absolutely important to have gear that is windproof. It's not necessarily about being waterproof at those kind of temperatures, but most certainly windproof. And the whole idea is no cotton, wool layers, as well as polyester or synthetic layers. Make sure you have all of your skin covered. Any little bit of skin that is exposed can become dangerously cold. Now I hope that brings you guys some insight into the gear that actually worked for me. I'm not saying that this is the ultimate gear. This is just what worked for me and hopefully it gives you some insight of perhaps what might work for you in your journey. For me, making this trek north was a huge, huge learning experience. And so I wanted to create this video in order to share with you some of the knowledge that I gained from making this trip. This trip was by far one of the coolest and one of the most extreme adventures yet that I have taken in my van. So hopefully this video helps you guys fill in some of the gaps and the questions that you might have if you're thinking about making a journey just like this. So with that, if you guys are new to the channel and have not yet subscribed, make sure and hit the subscribe button. Make sure and leave your comment in the comment section down below. Hit the like button, share it with any friends that you feel like might be interested in a video like this. From here, headed out to find the next Live in the Van Life adventure. We'll catch you guys down the road. Peace out, keep on trucking.